What are the top obstacles to peaceful coexistence of Israelis and Palestinians? Um, the, the occupation comes to mind. Uh, the shoot to kill policies come to mind. The siege comes to mind. The asymmetry of the judiciary comes to mind. The whole, the whole system needs to be dismantled. I will quote my dear friend Rabbi Agbariya, who's uh, who's a lawyer, who says, you know, the solution, justice comes about through recognition, return, and redistribution. There are millions of Palestinian refugees who are living in excruciating circumstances in refugee camps around the world. There are thousands of Palestinian prisoners um, who are held in prisons for defending their homes, hundreds of which are held without charge or trial, by the way. There are many Palestinians who get killed in broad daylight with no recourse, journalists and medics and everyday people, not just the fire, uh, the freedom fighters. Um, we need, again, recognition, return, and redistribution. And peace comes about when... when when they stop killing us, when they stop keeping us in a cage. I mean, that's that's quite simple. Can you describe recognition, redistribution, return and redistribution? Return, return, right of return, right? The right of return to all of the Palestinian refugees to their homes. You know, when I'm driving around Haifa and I see my grandmother's uh, home that's now turned into a, a restaurant, you know, I could have, you know, I, I made a joke in one of my essays recently that... Uh, had I had that, I could have had it all, you know, the beachfront views, her smug attitude. You know, she grew up by the she grew up by the sea after she relocated to Haifa when she, after, you know, Jerusalem. Um we want that. We want that. I mean, I'm, you know, they're lucky I don't want Netanyahu's home, but I just want my home. I just want my home. We want to return. I also when there needs, you know, in like I believe in the nineteen sixties the Israeli government classified 90% of all of historic Palestine as state-owned land. This is all land that was owned by Palestinian farmers who have cultivated their lands for decades. You know, since the establishment of the Israeli state, there has been uh, Jewish-only towns popping up every few years, and not one town, not one Palestinian town has emerged. We are, even those of us who have Israeli, uh, Israeli citizenship, who live outside of the wall, are encircled and cannot have their natural community growth in their towns. That needs to change. That needs to change. You mentioned the wall. Can you describe the wall? The wall is a nine meter high cement wall uh, that was finished in 2003. And if you're American, you've probably heard the whitewashed sanitized version of the name, which is the security wall. But it's a, it's a wall that literally has stolen thousands of dunams of land and has ripped apart families. My mother is a poet or was a poet at some point, and she had this uh, poem she, she published in the paper called Love Behind the Wall. And it describes, you know, it's, it's a poem, but it describes a real life situation of uh, two families that, who lived right across the street from each other, but were then separated by the wall. And they would fly balloons, um, you know, to see each other from each side of the wall or, or something like that. Um, this, although it sounds absurd, but it's the reality for many Palestinian families whose lives were torn apart, whose livelihoods also were torn apart uh, by the wall. Maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about the, the legal classifications for Palestinians. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Israel, much like any other colonial entity, uh, was has divined, uh, has divided and fragmented the Palestinian people. Um, as I said earlier, I have a blue ID, which means I'm a resident. A friend of mine who lives in Haifa, for example, two hours away from me, 150 kilometers, not nothing too bad in this country, has an Israeli citizenship. He can, you know, travel. He can enter the West Bank. He can. Um, do a lot more. He's a citizen. He can vote if he wants to. Not that we want to. Um, you know, I always tease my friends, oh, you can go to Italy without, without a visa because you have an Israeli citizenship. But, you know, they battle national erasure. They battle um, crime in their own communities because of police negligence. They, they battle land, confis land confiscation and have battled land co confiscations in the 50s. Whereas somebody with a green ID, um, somebody from the West Bank, uh, cannot leave the West Bank, cannot go anywhere without 
a special permit and lives behind these walls. And even within the West Bank, the West Bank, I think hilariously, George Bush uh, described it as Swiss cheese because of the holes every every few every hundred meters there's a new settlement or there's a new military checkpoint so even if you live behind the wall in the west bank with your green id even though you're ro you're robbed of your right to movement you still even can't move from town to town within the west bank without encountering settler violence or military violence while you're crossing the checkpoints and so on and so forth and then the last category we have is people who live in Gaza. We are talking about over 2 million people who live in an open-air prison, um, who have no right to movement, but also have no access to clean water, water and no access to uh, supplies, no access to good food, no access to good health care, and so on and so forth, who routinely get bombarded every few years. Um, Gaza is like two hours away from my house. It feels like an absolute faraway planet because it's so isolated from the rest of the country. So imagine all of these different legal statuses fragmenting um, your everyday identity and creating different challenges and obstacles for you to deal with, for each group to deal with. You know, it's amazing and impressive that despite these colonial barriers, the, the, the real cement ones and uh, you know, the barriers in the mind, despite all of these barriers, the Palestinian people have made have maintained their national identity for 70 years. That is incredibly impressive. And it also sends a message that as long as we have a boot on our neck, we're going to continue fighting. You know, violence, cracking down on refugee camps, bombarding refugee camps is only gonna bring about more violence. So West Bank is a large region where a lot of Palestinian people live and then there are settlements sprinkled throughout and those settlements have walls around them yeah. with security cameras and security guards security guards There's almost a million settlers in the west bank and so what are the different cities here if you can mention so in the west bank in the west bank ramallah janine bethlehem hebron jericho yeah nablus yeah, talk so him. they have their own stories they have their own histories yeah and it's fascinating also how interconnected they are, you know, like uh, a friend of mine, Muna Omari, recently did a, a, a documentary report on the day that Haifa fell during the Zionist invasion. The Haganah um, led the Palestinian residents of Haifa down to the city center. And as absurd as it sounds, those of them who stood on the right side of the street were forced into cars that took them to multiple stops that would later become multiple refugee camps, the last of which was Janine refugee camp. And um, those who stood on the left side of the street were forced to board uh, boats that took them to Lebanon to become refugee camps, uh, refugees there. Uh, last month, we saw the Israeli army invade Janine in maybe the largest military invasion of Janine since 2002. Mm -hmm. um, and they killed many people. They attacked medics and journalists in broad daylight on camera. They have destroyed infrastructure and it was all very painful. But I think the most compelling um, aspect of the raid on Janine was what followed. Uh, Israeli soldiers at night held their megaphones and uh, instructed hundreds of Palestinians to flee their homes. And they told them, if you don't leave, if you don't have your hand up in the air, you will get shot. And they were forced to leave their homes in the camp and walk to God knows where. I can guarantee you, because the Nakba is not that old, I can guarantee you that some people who were marching away from their camps, who were chased away from their homes in the camp in Janine, were some of the same people who were chased away from the homes in Haifa in the first place. This perpetual exile that Palestinian people continue to live is, is unbearable. I mean, in my case, my grandmother was removed from her home in, in Haifa in 48, and then she moved from city to city. And then in 2009, she saw half of her home taken over by Israeli soldiers. My grandmother died in 2020, and two months later, we got the next expulsion order from the Israeli court. I'm quite ashamed to admit that I was relieved that my grandmother had died because I did not want her, 103 years old at the time, 
to go through yet another Nakba. And this is the fact for so many Palestinians, regardless of where they are on the map. If I may read the description of the situation in Jenin, and maybe you can comment. So this is on July 3rd, 4th, and 5th, just reading Washington Post description. So this was an Israeli military incursion to Jenin. The raid included more than 1,000 soldiers backed by drone strikes, making it Israel's largest such operation in the West Bank since the end of the second Palestinian uprising in 2005. The Israeli military said it dismantled hundreds of explosives, cleared hundreds of weapons, destroyed underground hideouts, and confiscated hundreds of thousands of dollars in, quote, terror funds. Many of the 50 Palestinians who have attacked Israelis since the start of the year have come from Jenin camp and the surrounding area. Palestinian attacks inside Israel have killed 24 people this year. UN experts describe the Jenin operation as collective punishment, in quotes, uh, for the Palestinian people, amounting to egregious violations of international law. Many of the more than 150 Palestinians killed by Israelis this year have also come from these communities. Palestinian fighters say they need arms to defend themselves against the Israeli occupation and military incursions into the camp during which Palestinian civilians, including children, have been killed. So th those are the, I would say, different perspectives on the many people on both sides who have been killed, many more Palestinians. Can you comment more about the situation? I mean, I think the the Washington Post article is a little bit more, uh, you know, careful than other than other media that came out recently about Janine. I think you know, I was listening to a Reuters radio show, and they failed to ever mention the occupation. I don't, I don't even think this paragraph mentioned that Janine is under occupation by the by the Israeli forces, by the Israeli regime. I think this is the most important piece of context that gets. Um, obscured in our media reporting is these cities, these refugee camps are under illegal occupation. The Israeli army has no business being there in the first place. Um, that is the most, that is the departure point. That is the most important piece of context that will answer to you why these people um, are arming themselves. Many of which, by the way, lived through the 2002 massacre um, and bombardment of Janine and grew up in that um, violence. Um, the the context that Palestine is under occupation, that these Palestinian cities are under occupation, that they have to deal with land seizures at all times, that they cannot leave their towns um, without a special permit. All of this will give context to the violence. And, you know, the thousands of Israeli soldiers that raided the camp that day, that traumatized an entire generation. They think they will quell that generation. They think that with such bloodshed and such barbaric violence, destroying infrastructure, attacking medics, killing people left and right, they think with this kind of terror that they can, you know, quell people, tell people that, you know, they can guarantee that these kids are not going to grow up and resist. But that's the opposite of what happens. One thing about Palestinian people they will not compromise their dignity. You know, these people live in, yani, live in dire, excruciating circumstances. And it is so courageous, in my opinion, that they even think um, to defend themselves against one of the most lethal, one of the most sophisticated armies in the world, against a nuclear state that can wipe them out in the matter of seconds. But it's not, at the end of the day, it's not even about courage. It's about survival. They don't do this because, you know, of machismo or because of uh, heroic tendencies. It's because this is about survival. So the degree there's violence, it's about survival. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think if there is no, if there was no occupation, there would be no violence. It's, it's quite obvious. And again, people understand this. I mean, like we saw on Twitter in, in the recent month, uh, all of these Israeli uh, propagandists who had tweeted pictures of like little girls with guns in Ukraine and like women making bombs in Ukraine and, and young men carrying their rifles in Ukraine and praising them as heroes, post very similar pictures of Palestinians um, and calling them terrorists. 
it's glaring, the double standard. I don't even need to linger on it. Well, the double standard is glaring, but I also think the glorification of violence is questionable. There's a balance to be struck, of course, but... Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think we should be glorifying violence um, at all. But I don't think we should be normalizing violence either. Yeah. Uh, I think point. that's 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 what it is. You know, I'll tell you a story. I was interviewing a person whose uh, brother was killed by the Israeli military during a Israeli raid on their village, and the person was so concerned about whether I was going to report that her brother allegedly had a Molotov cocktail in his hand. And I found it absolutely insane, absolutely absurd that we can just glance over the fact that there is, again, a foreign military in tanks with rifles and snipers invading the village at 4 a.m. in the morning, shooting live ammunition, at people's houses, throwing tear gas. That we can just glance over, it's normal. We could just report on it. No problem, nobody's gonna bat an eyebrow. But the fact that potentially somebody might have picked up a Molotov cocktail to throw it at this invading army is where we draw the line. It says a lot. It says a lot about whose violence is normalized, is accepted, is institutionalized, is glorified even, right? And you walk around Tel Aviv and you see all of the plaques plastered around the, around the streets of the country, uh, of the city, um, celebrating the battles that they had won, the massacres that they had enacted um, against the Palestinian people. But God forbid, God forbid Palestinians have any kind of similar sentiment. So on July 4th, during this intense period, a Palestinian rammed a car into pedestrians at a bus stop in Tel Aviv, injuring eight people before being shot dead by a passerby. Also that night, Hamas fired rockets into Israel, and then Israel responded with strikes on what it said was an underground weapon site. So just to give some context to the intense violence happening here, uh, what do you think about Hamas firing rockets into Israel? Well, it's the framing makes it seem as though like unprovoked Hamas is like firing rockets onto Israel, regardless of what I think of Hamas, obviously, but unprovoked. But that's not the case. The provocation is the fact that they are forced to live in a cage, that they have no access to clean water, they have no access to basic rights, no access to uh, imports, no access to anything. Um, that they can't leave. They're living in a densely populated enclave that was deemed uninhabitable by the UN, that was deemed an open air prison. Um, so the rockets, in any case, are retaliation for the siege. Let's start there. But again, this is just to prove my point. Violence begets violence. Palestinian people are not violent people. We are not violent people at the core. And I think, you know, what serves this narrative is Islamophobia, is like xenophobia towards Arabs, which we don't have, like, I don't have the luxury, you know, to like, to write laws about. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite, you know, frustrated by this. Uh, I am, I am preoccupied, and the Palestinian people are preoccupied um, with the material violence that we have to deal with on the day-to-day, -day, the demolitions, the bombings, uh, the imprisonment. That's what we're distracted with and, and busy with, that we can't even talk about the racism, um, the casual racism against us, the anti-Palestinian racism, be it in the media, on social media, and diplomatic circles. And But all of this, all of this racism that has gone unchecked, that has not been regulated, um, for decades allows for these tropes to continue in which Palestinians are promoted as these like barbaric terrorists. And the only way we could remedy uh, that situation is to is by um, marketing them as these like defenseless victims. But the fact of the matter is, is, is not this simplistic. Palestinian people are human beings who should enjoy a full spectrum of humanity, which in, in, includes uh, rage, which includes uh, disdain, which includes happiness and joy and laughter, which includes celebration, which includes um, 
all of these things, but we're not allowed this. But we are doing exactly what any people throughout history who have been oppressed, who have been colonized, who have been occupied, have done and continue to do, as we see in Ukraine, which is celebrated by mainstream media. I'm sorry to uh, keep reiterating this point, but, you know, at, at this point, uh, I am quite, you know, exhausted by how exceptional Palestine and Palestinian resistance is when the world tells me time and time again that it doesn't have a problem with violence, it just has a problem with who does that violence. Do you in your mind, and in, in the way you see this region, uh, draw a distinction between the people in power versus the regular people? So you mentioned the Palestinian people. Is there something you can comment on on Hamas and the PLO? Uh, do you see them as fundamentally different from the people? Uh, what does Hamas do well? Where do they fall short? I think governments, uh, wherever globally, Annie, are different from people. No government is a true reflection of its people. I think, uh, you know, this is even true in the case of like Arab countries that normalize with Israel. In many of the cases, they're um, unelected governments. I think the Palestinian Authority continues to fail. Um, I think they are subcontractors of the Israeli regime through their security coordination. And also, I'd like to use this as an opportunity to comment a little bit on the on the analogy thing, not to like s s stray away from the question. But you know, um, the Palestinian Authority two years ago killed an opposition activist named Nizar Banat. It was a horrendous crime. And I was in Ramallah with the people protesting against the Palestinian Authority. And um, at some point they had their batons, the Palestinian Authority police, and they beat us with it. And many of the people in the crowd were likening the Palestinian Authority to Zionism. I think people, this is what people do we, uh, when they are confronted by a great evil. They liken it to some other great evil. And this is where the Hitler analogy came from. Um, again, I don't think it's like the best strategy moving forward, but I refuse, you know, to be, uh, you know, criminalized for a little sentence. But to, to linger on those in power, so one of the criticisms towards Hamas and PLO, towards the Israeli government, uh, at least the current coalition government, is um, that there's a lot of incentive to sort of perpetuate violence to maintain power. There's a hunger for power and, and maintaining that power amongst the powerful. That's the way power works. So is there um, a worry you have about uh, those in power not having the best interests of its people? So those in power, the PLO, Hamas, not... Uh, not being incentivized towards peace, towards justice. You know, looking at the PA's action today, it tells you a great deal about what they're interested in and what they're not interested in. And maybe, yeah, the occupation is in their best interest. Um, and you can infer similar things looking at, at Hamas, but the two, the two, these two entities virtually have no power even Hamas, um, yani, there is, you know, the, the context that Hamas is permitted through by international law uh, to use armed resistance, blah, blah, blah. Does that mean Hamas is like equipped to govern Gaza? I don't mm -hmm. think so. Does that mean that uh, people around Palestine necessarily want to, want to live under uh, Hamas rule? In 2006, Hamas was democratically elected. I don't know if that's still the case today. Um, there is there's a lot to be said, but neither of these entities have any real power um, in in perpetuating. They don't. They, the only the only body that has access that can flip the switch in all of this equation is the Israelis. You know, they're the ones who are keeping people in a cage. They're the ones who are um, wrapping the West Bank with a, with a wall. 
Um, everything else to me is just secondary, regardless of what I think personally of any of those people. I know personally for me, I, I, the world I envision, not just Palestine, the world I envision is a world that goes beyond states, um, that goes beyond this uh, uh, framing of power. This, this hierarchy in which uh, some people rule over other people, this whole idea of nation states, be it Israel or any other nation states, is, it's, it's, it's futile, it's not good, it's exclusive. I think that we can achieve a better world than that. Well, the, you know, how do you do a better world? They, actually, if you just linger on that, like what, <laughs> politically speaking, geopolitically, you have to have representation of the people you have to have laws and you have to have leaders and governing bodies that enact those laws and all those kinds of things. You probably need to have militaries to protect the people. Can you not imagine a world without militaries? I can imagine it, but we're not in that world. Yeah, I'm not saying, you know, I have all the answers or a PowerPoint in my pocket, you know, with the instructions, but I, I'm saying the world I'd like to live in is one that transcends borders, is one that you know does not necessitate militaries that doesn't necessitate all of these um prisons all of these walls all of these racist laws so you don't think violence is a fundamental part of human nature that emerges and, and uh, like combined with the hunger for power i do think i do think that both of these things are like truly intrinsic to to human beings but I also do think there is a way to move beyond them. I'm not saying I have the answers. Um, I'm tempted to say sway, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you have a hope that there, um, there doesn't have to be war yeah, yeah. in the world. Definitely, definitely.